Starbase crews grind to prepare for Starship Super Heavy's first flight. Another Starlink mission flies nominally. You have been given another opportunity to ride to space on Dragon. And we finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. Over the weekend, Elon marked his territory with a new Starbase sign along Highway 4. And it lights up, just to make sure even those who struggle to read in the dark recognize he's super serial about his city to Mars. I'm trying to warn everybody and nobody takes me serial! In Starbase, Starship 15 rests on suborbital pad B, where it was lifted and placed this week. Still no plan has been given as to what the plan is for the vehicle, now that it completed a 10-click flight. Last we heard, SpaceX may try to refly it, and it certainly seems that way since it's back on the pad. But they could always just run stress tests on it, or perhaps light those engines back up to rapidly cure that freshly poured concrete below. One of its Raptor engines, SN54, was removed today. We do have one road closure for today, first one in a week, but it's for transporting something down or up Highway 4. Starship 16 is next in line. It's currently waiting its turn for transport to the launch site. It may fly to a higher altitude like 20 clicks, but nothing has confirmed that either. Then it's likely we'll start seeing some super heavy booster action. BN3 has begun stacking in the high bay and is widely believed that this one will be the first to fly. BN1 was just a trial build, BN2 could be used for stress testing, but SpaceX may have opted to skip the planned few hundred meter hop with two Raptor engines and loo for a full up mission with Starship on top. We spoke about the FCC filing for this first flight in last week's episode. Originally, Elon said they were aiming for July for the first orbital flight, and according to recent filings, the window opens on June 20th, but that's looking pretty unlikely. However, it wouldn't be unreasonable to believe that the launch could happen later this summer. And when it does fly, they'll be splashing down both stages. The Super Heavy booster off the coast of Texas and the upper stage Starship off the coast of Kauai. Elon twatted that they need to make sure that the ship won't break up upon re-entry, hence the deorbit over the Pacific. Something he expressed concern about in the past, and it appears for this first space flight, Starship won't make orbit before re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Probably a good call. You don't want to risk losing control of the big rocket as it flies over land. Leave that to China. To launch Starship's Super Heavy into orbit requires a giant launch tower. Well, it just so happens one has been under construction at Starbase for several months now. This week, a good amount of work going on at the site has been dedicated to erecting a few giant cranes. These things are massive and will be needed to stack built segments of the tower. Yesterday, Elon agreed to hold another Starship presentation at Starbase this year, something he typically does every late summer to early fall. Although canceled last year's due to COVID, these give him the chance to inform the public of all the exciting things they're up to behind the scenes and gets the rest of us energized. And it reads like he is still looking to fly SN15, given the lack of any corrective input to Austin's request here. A few other quick fun facts about what's going on at Starbase. Builds are underway to prepare for test mounting of the first Raptor vacuum engines, which of course will be used while Starship, presumably SN20, is in space heading toward Kauai. And also, a methane pipe feeding system for Super Heavy's 28 Raptor engines has also been located on site. SpaceX software engineers took to Reddit this week for an Ask Me Anything session. This is something they do from time to time, especially when they're looking for new hires. And so I picked out a couple of my favorite answers to questions asked by the community. First one up, a response to Starship's flip and burn maneuver prior to landing. SpaceX engineers responded that Starship is designed to choose in real time the engine or engines best suited to execute the maneuver, and they're always updating the software to be smarter at detecting potential engine problems and to adjust accordingly. Also, a question I know many of you are really curious about, deets concerning the interior of a crewed Starship and the user interface. The technology will likely be similar to Dragon, but the design, usage, and goals of the onboard Starship UI are notably different from Dragon. Instead of three touch screens next to each other, they will be of various sizes, stationed around different compartments of Starship, like common areas, living quarters, loading areas, and yes, the bridge. Beam me up, Scotty. Yeah, Moving on to Starlink. On Saturday, SpaceX launched their 28th Starlink mission overall, this one being another rideshare, carrying 52 Starlink sats and two additional satellites for a couple customers. Okay, 
pitching down range. All were successfully deployed to orbit, and the reused booster made an impressive landing on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship for an eighth time. This was the first time that non-SpaceX payloads rode on such a highly reused rocket. For the last eight months, SpaceX's testing facility in McGregor, Texas, has seen mostly Falcon Heavy boosters and Raptor engines come through their neck of the woods. SpaceX has been relying on flight-proven Falcon 9 boosters for their missions lately and hasn't been producing new ones. But just this week, local Reagan captured a brand new Falcon 9 leaving the site on its way to the Cape. It will be used on the upcoming Cargo Dragon resupply mission to the ISS. SpaceX sea vessel gazers in Florida have said their goodbyes to the lightly used fare and recovery ship, Sheila Bordelon. She departed Port Canaveral for the last time this week. From now on, her duties that she inherited from the late Miss Tree and Miss Cheap will be passed on to Go Searcher and presumably Go Navigator. Of course, these SpaceX ships are primarily used to recover Dragon capsules. The final member of NASA's Crew-3 crew has been announced. And no, it's not a Russian cosmonaut, it's Kayla Barron a fresh graduate of astronaut training and a former Naval Submarine Warfare Officer. This will be the first launch of three of the four crew members. Commander Marshburn has flown on two previous missions dating back to STS-127. If you would like to go to space, fall free. Here's yet another opportunity. The Discovery Channel's Who Wants to Be an Astronaut is looking for applicants. Winners will head to the space station on what is presumed to be the Axe 2 mission aboard a Crew Dragon capsule for a stay at the International Space Station. To apply, simply submit a 30 to 60 second video of yourself begging for a seat to get off this dumb planet. Give me it. Give me it. Come on, give me it. And finally, Firefly Aerospace has awarded SpaceX the contract to take their Blue Ghost lander to the moon in 2023. Blue Ghost will carry 10 payloads for NASA's commercial lunar payload services, as well as other contracted commercial payloads. And now, a word from our sponsor. Nomad is back to sponsor this video because they're good people with good taste and their products are good too. Take for example, this base station mini wireless charger that they were kind enough to send me, along with some other great gear that the lawyer wife permanently borrowed. But I love this, and you know why? It's because unlike previous base chargers I've used in the past, this one actually does its job and charges my phone, instead of causing me to oversleep in the morning because apparently my phone's case is too thick and other base chargers just allow it to die. But not with this one. This one also charges really fast too. So check out their products using the link in the description below and be sure to use promo code SXC for 20% off in stock and full price items. And now it's time for today's honorable mention. After a 24 hour delay on Monday due to technical issues, ULA launched their latest Atlas V rocket carrying a military satellite from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Check out the side booster separation. Giggity. This was the fifth of Space Force's SPURS missile detecting satellites to reach orbit. Two CubeSats from the Air Force Academy also hitchhiked on this one and marked ULA's first Florida launch of the year. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you for tuning in. And a very special thank you goes out to my eccentric members and patrons. Do have a nominal weekend. And until next time, Godspeed. Today we're going to discuss China landing their first rover on Mars and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But the thing is, our discussion takes us across a wide variety of topics. So it's a little long, but informative. And because I like to keep these SpaceX and the news episodes under 10 minutes when I can, I went ahead and uploaded it as its own unlisted video. So if you'd like to hear my message for this episode, and I highly recommend that you do, Go ahead and click on the link in the description below. I'll also put a video right here for you, and maybe I can even squeeze in an annotation if those are on. For those of you on Rumble, I'll go ahead and upload it as its own separate public video. See you there.